We're moving on to our next speaker, um, who's Michael Washigishik Price. Um, Michael Washigishik Price is a traditional ecological knowledge specialist at the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission of Odana, Wisconsin. He is enrolled member of the We Wick We Mekong First Nations of Canada. And Michael, I apologize if I completely butchered that name. I will do my best to learn it. His role as TEK specialist involves integrating Anishinaabe language and cultural perspectives into research methods and resource management to make science more culturally relevant. Michael received his Master of Science in Forestry from the University of Montana and his Certificate of Ojibwe Language Instruction from Bemidji State University. Michael, I'll go ahead and pass it on over to you. Hello, miigwech, Rosie. So good to see you. <laughs> yeah, it's good to see you again after so long. <laughs> after yeah. so long? Yeah, a couple of years. A couple of years. Yeah. So, uh, bonjour and dinaway ma ganadug, Michael Price, was a gijik indigena cause, makwa nindo dem, lifwa gijina cause, nindanoki, o manungum, uh, midash, uh, wikwem kong, uh, uh, dipindal zian, uh, nimigwechi windum, uh, uh, ejia yayan, o manungum. Oh, I wanted to introduce you, introduce myself to you, uh, in my Anishinaabe language and, uh, my name is Michael Price Wasagijik. I am Anishinaabe. I am Bear Clan. And I work at the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission, which we call Glithwick uh, for short. And I am an enrolled member at Wikpungzong, as, uh, as Rosie um, had stated. And uh, it's a pleasure to be with all of you here today. And um, thank you so much. I want to thank Rosie. Uh, and all the team members who put this uh, conference together, um, staff, Amanda, it's been really great to, to come back here again. My presentation is really similar to, to two years ago, but uh, I, I've updated it and, and, and gave it some more material. So uh, but I hope you enjoy it. But uh, let me um, go ahead and put my screen up. So many of you know that uh, Wisconsin is really kind of becoming a, a battlefield, a political battlefield uh, over the conservation of wolves. And uh, currently, you know, the, the wolves are in protective status, but there is a political movement to, uh, uh, to, to change that dynamic in our state. So I wanted to offer you today uh, some of the reflections and, and some of the teachings of Anishinaabe people. Um, uh, about our relationship with Maingan, which is our Ojibwe word for uh, wolf. So a little in land acknowledgement here. Um, um, I'm coming to you from northern Wisconsin on the shores of Lake Superior, and this is the homeland of the Anishinaabe people. And this map that I'm showing you here uh, is a map of our service area. So we are the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission, and we work for 11 federally recognized tribes across Michigan, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. And our job is to manage the fish and the wildlife and the natural resources on the ceded territory that was ceded to the United States in the 1800s. So if you look at this map here, the colored areas, uh, the, the, the greens, the yellows, and the purples, those are all the millions of acres that were seeded from the tribes to create the United States. And these were the years in which those treaties were signed, 1836, 1837, 1842, and 1854. The red specks that you see in there are the actual reservations that were actually created uh, in the Treaty of 1854. Uh, but in 1837 and 42, those reservations did not exist. Okay. So what we do, we manage the, the, the fish and wildlife and natural resources, not on the reservations, but the off reservations. And the reason why we do that is because when our ancestors went to the negotiating table in 1837 and 1842, those elders said, yes, we will seed these millions of acres to you to create the United States, but we want the right 
to reserve, we want to reserve the right to hunt, to fish and gather so that our future generations can provide for themselves in the futures to come. And of course, the United States agreed to those terms and then they signed the treaties uh, in these years. Keep in mind that the state of Wisconsin wasn't even founded until 1848. That was six years before uh, the 1842 treaty was signed. And when the, the states were formed, Michigan or Wisconsin and Minnesota, there was kind of a belief uh, that when the states were formed, that all of those treaties with tribes somehow became just, just null, uh, non-existent. And for over a hundred years, when native people would go out into these territories to hunt deer or the fish for walleye or to gather berries, um, you know, they, they were persecuted by the state, you know, especially the people that were fishing. They had they had their boats confiscated, they were fined, some of them were jailed. But they had the right to do that all along. And it wasn't until the, the, the 1980s that finally some some young native activists. Uh, challenged these treaty rights in federal court. And in 1983, they actually won their court settlement. And the United States uh, Circuit Court of Appeals said, yes, you do have the right to hunt and fish and gather, just as the treaties are stated. And we just had our 40th uh, celebration uh, last week, celebrating the, the signing of that, uh, that treaty, uh, or, or actually the reaffirmation of those treaty rights. But if you look at this map here, too, this is also prime wolf habitat, especially when you look at the upper peninsula of Michigan, uh, the north shore of Lake Superior, and then on up into northeast Minnesota. This was prime wolf habitat, and it still is today. So this is who I am, and this is who I work for uh, today. So I wanted to talk a little bit about how Anishinaabe people see themselves connected to Maingan, uh, the wolf. And I got a couple of stories that I want to share with you. In our creation story, when the first man was set here on the earth, and we call that person, sometimes we call it Anishinaabe, sometimes we call it uh, Nanabojo. Um, Nanabojo began to walk the earth and began to name all the plants and the trees, the rivers, the valleys, the mountains. But over time, Nanabojo became lonely. And so he asked the, the grand creator uh, who placed him on the earth that, I am lonely here, can you send me a companion? And according to our stories, Gije Manidu, the great spirit, sent down Maingan, the wolf. And together, the wolf, and Nanabojo traveled the entire continent, and they became familiar with all the plant life and, and the rivers and the lakes. And when that journey became uh, came to its end, the Great Spirit spoke to both of them and said, you have completed your journey, and now you will walk separate paths. Anishinaabe will go in this direction, Maingan will go in the other direction, but always remember that you are brothers from the very beginning. And so that story tells us our relationship with the wolf. And it tells us that we, we are a close relative to Maingan. In fact, our story is actually preserved in the stars. And we look at this constellation in the wintertime, and what we know as, what science knows as Orion is, is Nanabojo, or, or uh, Anishinaabe, and then Canis Major is Maingan. And together, those two walked the earth and became acquainted with all living things. And this is where we get a lot of our teachings from as Anishinaabe people. And by the way, these constellations are rising in the sky tonight. If you go out tonight around 10 or 11, you can see them in the eastern sky. Uh, they're beginning to, uh, to rise in, at night. Another story that we always share is this sacred connection between Maingan, the wolf, and the raven, Gagagi. 
And we recognize this sacred relationship in nature, especially in the wintertime when food is scarce and things are frozen. So the, the ravens don't migrate. They stay here all winter long. But when the ravens find a carcass in the woods, you know, they're not strong enough themselves to tear into that frozen carcass. So what the raven does is go up and light up into a tree above that carcass, and they begin to caw. They begin to speak very loudly. And soon the wolf will identify that caw from the raven, and the wolves will start heading in that direction. And then when the wolves find that carcass, they begin to rip and tear, and they begin to feed on that carcass. The whole while, Raven is sitting up in the tree very patiently waiting for the wolf to, to finish. And once the wolves get their, their fill, then they go off, they go about their way, and now the ravens come down, and they finish feeding. And so here in this way, there's a sacred relationship. The raven depends upon the wolf. And the wolf depends upon the raven. In science, we call that symbiosis. But to us, we call it a sacred relationship. And this is another teaching that is passed down through us uh, when we talk about our relatives, the wolves, and our relatives, uh, the raven. So in our language, we have some, some teachings that we, we always share with, uh, with one another. And one of those teachings is in Dinawe Maganan, Mayinganug. The wolves are our relatives. They're not species, or they're not critters, or um, um, they they are a close relative to us. And you know, when you consider something your relative, it changes the way that you regard them and the way you make decisions with them, as opposed to being. Uh, uh, a resource or a, a species. So in Dinoe Maganinan, my Inganug, the wolves are our relatives. Another teacher we have, Ningekno Maganan, my Ingan, the wolf is our teacher. We see the wolf is teaching us about uh, values that we integrate into our lives, like family values, because a pack is basically a family. Okay, it's mother, father, children, aunties, uncles, and they all live together. They all hunt together. They all take care of one another's children. So this is one thing that we learn from the wolf. We also learn the value of extended family. Like sometimes we bring in uh, other people that are distant relatives or not even related at all, and they became part of our family. We also learn this from the wolf as well. So we regard the wolf as a teacher, and he's very important in, in our society. And we learn from the wolf. Even today, uh, as our science is getting better, and, and we incorporate science into our work at Glyphwick, we're starting to learn now that the wolves are very effective at managing CWD, uh, 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 chronic wasting disease, that exists in our, our ungulates, our, our elk and our deer. For us scientists, we have to, to we, if we find a deer carcass, we have to remove the head, we have to, to ship the, the tissues off to a lab, and we have to wait two weeks uh, for the lab results. A wolf can identify immediately if a deer is infected with chronic wasting disease. They can see things that we cannot uh, as human beings. So again, this wolf has this elevated status of being a teacher uh, to our community. And then the last teacher, Nimanaji Ananik Maninganuk. We have respect for the wolves and we see them as equals. We, we don't see them as lesser than us. We see them as our equals in society and they are deserving the same respect and the same sovereignty that we have as indigenous peoples as Anishinaabe people. And so the wolf is very highly regarded in our community. And I wanted to share that with you today. But we have another teaching in our society too, uh, that has really become apparent in the last three or four years. And the way we say it in our language is, Aninago ejue bizid maingan, miga ejue bizid anishinaabe, midash. Aninago 
ani nega wej wej zid anishinabe mige wej wej zid bayingan whatever happens to the wolf happens to the anishinabe and whatever happens to the anishinabe happens to the wolf and this teaching took root approximately 300 years ago uh when the first european immigrants started coming over to the new world and our ancestors were very observant about the relationships both between them the immigrants and themselves as as native people and we began to see something that was that was a current over those hundreds of years but it all began and, and elena also mentioned this too in her presentation that uh you know, a lot of these values and these attitudes that we have towards wolves, actually, uh, we believe that they came from Europe because uh, a lot of people that, that migrated to the, the United, the, the new United States, the 13 colonies, was were, sh were sheep herders and goat herders. And, and, of course, the one thing they feared the most was the wolf. So we have all these stories that, that have distorted um uh, our attitudes and our feelings about the wolf. We as Anishinaabe do not have these stories, these stories of villainization and these stories of fear. They're, they're not part of our stories at all. We have a constellation in the star world that, that reflects our relationship with Mayingan. But this is how uh, a lot of attitudes in, in, this, in this country uh, had formed. So with this fear, um, uh, the fear was enacted during the colonization of this continent. So as the painters and the artists began to depict wolves as villains, they also began to depict indigenous peoples as villains as well um, by these, uh, these two paintings, uh, uh, one from the early 1800s, um, or both of them, uh, where here is something to be feared so much that we're going to Paint it on a canvas, you know. Of course, today this would be almost like like social media in the early 1800s, and it did provoke fear. People were afraid of Indians. People were afraid of wolves. And as that fear grew over the generations, so did the policies, uh, so did the uh, political efforts of this newly forming continent, and many native people as well as wolves felt that. So then became the process of genocide uh, for the indigenous peoples and for the wolves. <clears throat> and throughout the 1800s, it was a campaign to exterminate all the wolves uh, throughout the, the newly forming uh, country. And at this very same time that this policy of wolf extermination was happening, um, the extirpation of, of uh, indigenous lands was also uh, in full gear, um, especially in 1887 with the passage of the, the, the notorious Dawes Act, which is also called the General Allotment Act. And this is where, after those millions of acres were ceded to the United States and they formed these little reservations so that Native people could live on those reservations, in 1887, the Dawes Act was passed to even break up the reservations and to put them up for uh, uh, private ownership. So as you see in this poster here, Indian lands for sale. And many reservations across the country, in fact, nearly all of them were quote unquote allotted. They were broken up into private land ownership. I think there's only two reservations that were not allotted and that's the Red Lake Band of Chippewa Indians in, in Northern uh, Minnesota. And I one out in Oregon, I believe. Okay, so what was happening to the wolves was also happening to the Anishinaabe people, the indigenous peoples. Also, in uh, 1878, 1879, there was a federal policy to take children away from their families and put them into these boarding schools where they would be taught English, they would be taught the trade, and they would, be, they would be taught Christianity. And these children were punished for speaking their language. They were punished for making any types of regards to their, their former life. 
And um, this was also a sad chapter in history that, that is only becoming known uh, to the greater public now. And, and this, is, this started in 1878, but actually in the 1940s, my own mother actually attended one of these schools for nine years. She attended it from uh, age nine to age 18. And in that time frame, she lost her language. She lost her identity as an Anishinaabe woman. And she didn't have the ability to teach me anything about my culture, my language, my heritage. Uh, and she felt really sad about that. And this is why today I teach Ojibwe language uh, at the college level, uh, because I went back to reclaim the language that these schools took away from my mother. So this was going on, too. While the wolves were being exterminated, the Native people were being stripped of their identity and their culture. And this is another uh, picture of the assimilation process where, you know, the, the, the picture on the left is, is the, the, the native, young Native man that is to be feared. And then the picture on the right is that same Native man, but now he's a member of society and is not to be feared. So this was a brutal, brutal policy uh, by the United States on, uh, on indigenous peoples. And just to kind of talk about some of the sentiments back then, President Theodore Roosevelt in, in 1901 said, the wolf is an archetype of raven, the beast of waste and desolation. And it is still found scattered thinly throughout all the wider portions of the United States, but has everywhere retreated from the advance of civilization. In that same year, President Theodore Roosevelt also said, the only good Indians are dead Indians. And then the founder of the Carlisle School, that, that picture that I just showed you, Captain Richard Pratt said, we must kill the Indian to save the man. In other words, we must remove the culture and the language and, and the, the, this, this hedonism, and, and we must bring them into uh, modernity. And that was the guiding philosophy of the, uh, the boarding schools. So now we're looking at the end of the 18, 1800s, beginning of the 1900s. In 1492, it was estimated that there were 2 million wolves that existed in the lower 48 states. And this was a, stu a study conducted by the, uh, the National Park Service. And it was also uh, estimated that approximately 60 million indigenous peoples existed in the United States. And this was by Koch a study done in 2019. Again, these are just estimates. Um, we didn't have data collection uh, um, as we know it back in those days. So in 1890, Native Americans in this country were 248,000. That, that was the lowest ever across the entire 48 states. In 1930, that number rose to 332,000. And then in 1940, 300. And 34,000. So Native people were at their lowest population as a result of the assimilation policies uh, by, the, by the federal government. But then in 1950, something began to change. A new consciousness had emerged in America. People began to realize, especially after Rachel Carson wrote her book, Silent Spring, people began to realize that the, our way of life has done a lot of damage. It's done a lot of damage to wildlife. It's done a lot of damage to the indigenous peoples. It's done a lot of damage to our environment in general. And throughout the 60s and 70s, there were, there were a series of legislations that were passed, which began to change the the direction of our society. So in 1973, the Endangered Species Act, um, there were a few other um, um, versions before that, but the most effective version was the 1973 Act that was signed by President Nixon. At the same time, in 1975, uh, President Ford, 
who preceded uh, President Nixon, uh, met with tribal leaders at the signing of the the Indian Self-Determination Act, which helped tribal governments get on their feet and to stand as, as a unified community and as a nation. Less than a year after the passage of the uh, of the ESA, uh, the wolves now had federal protection, which they had never had before. And this is a, a result because the wolves were nearly ex extirpated from all of the lower 48, with the exception of maybe the northeast corner of Minnesota and the upper peninsula of Michigan. And the wolves that survived that slaughter moved deep into the boreal forest where, you know, there basically were no settlement. Uh, it's a very harsh, uh, uh, rocky land, uh, very dense, thick, coniferous forest. And that's where they found protection. Up until they found federal protection with the federal government. So at the same time, when the, the Endangered Species Act was passed, there was a couple of other legislations that began to help Native people get back on their feet again. The Indian Civil Rights Act, 1968. The Indian Self-Determination Act, 1975. The American Indian Religious Freedom Act, 1978. Before 1978, it was illegal for indigenous peoples to conduct their ceremonies or have any type of uh, religious gatherings, even on the reservations. And a lot of people were arrested and persecuted uh, for those ceremonies until Congress passed the American Indian Religious Freedom Act. 1978, that wasn't that long ago. And then the Tribally Controlled Colleges and Universities Assistance Act, which helped to get tribal colleges started using federal funds. And this is also in 1978. Things began to really look up for wolves uh, after that. In 1995, uh, there was a reintroduction program in Yellowstone National Park. The wolves had been been absent from Yellowstone, I, I believe, for 66 years. Okay, and this reintroduction program, bringing Canadian wolves down to see if they could repopulate the area, um, became a major success. Probably one of the greatest successes in conservation. And then from that study, or from that um, uh, effort, came the emergence of a new discipline called trophic cascades, or a new scientific study. So things were really looking up for the wolves uh, uh, all the way up to 1995. And also, too, uh, tribal nations were beginning to bring their languages back. We began to create uh, 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 indigenous immersion schools. We we're bringing back our ceremonies now that there's no uh, persecution from the, from the government. Uh, so now our culture began to flourish as well, as well as the culture of the wolves. So you can see by looking at this whole history here that what happened to the wolf happened to us as Anishinaabe people and what happened to Anishinaabe people happened to the wolf. So we, we share common fates in this world. And we've saw, and, and that story is being reaffirmed over and over and over for the last 300 years. Now, 2021 in Wisconsin, I'm sure many of you are very familiar with this atrocity that happened uh, in our state here. Um, in February, the third week in February, there was a notorious wolf hunt that happened. Uh, where wolves were slaughtered way above the quota that the DNR had set. But if you go back and look at the history of this, our former president, President Donald Trump, made a campaign promise that he would remove the gray wolf from the ESA protections. It was not based on science. It was, a, it was, it was based on politics and election. Okay, and so he said that, and ironically... Um, the wolves officially became delist delisted on January 4th, 2021. And that was just two days before the, um, um, the storming of the Capitol. There was an intense amount of for political fervor in this country, an intense amount of vitriol, 
And we as in Native people, as Anishinaabe people of Wisconsin, really felt it. So this is kind of an outline of what happened. It was extremely political. Um, you know, the Wisconsin DNR, even though President Trump had delisted the wolves, uh, the Wisconsin DNR wanted to postpone the wolf hunt because we just weren't ready. We, we, we needed to update our wolf plan. We just weren't ready to have a wolf's a hunt so quick. But then a federal judge uh, ordered the wolf hunt to continue. And, and, and in the state, Wisconsin law, it says, if the wolves aren't under federal or state protection, then we, by law, have to have a wolf hunt. Okay, so this judge ordered the wolf hunt to continue, even though the DNR wasn't ready. So the DNR just very scrambled together, and they finally set a wolf quota for 119 wolves to be harvested in the spring of 2021. But again, like I said, that fervor was so intense uh, to go out and slaughter these wolves that the hunters actually killed, uh, as far as it was registered, 216 wolves in less than 60 hours. That was 86% over the quota. And this is not even counting the wolves that were killed and not registered or the ones that were wounded or gut shot. These were the wolves that were officially accounted for. And they actually uh, ignored the tribal consultation uh, that they were supposed to have consulted with the uh, the Glyphwick uh, Consortium, the 11 tribes that I had mentioned earlier. And the uh, um, because of this court case, the Natural Resources Board uh, ignored that request. So, um, And then the Natural Resources Board had scheduled to hold another wolf hunt in November of 2021, that same year, to kill another 300 wolves. And thank God, that's when that, that federal judge from California put the uh, the wolves back on uh, the, the, the protected endangered list again. So wolves have become a political pivotal point uh, in the state of Wisconsin. Wisconsin is the only state in the country that allows the use of dogs to track down and hunt wolves. And also hunters are, are permitted to use uh, all-terrain vehicles, four-wheelers, and snowmobiles so that they can hunt and track these wolves down at, at nighttime. And again, just an atrocity that, that, that's happening up here with the wolves. Um, it's pitted a lot of community members against each other. It's even broken up families. Uh, the, 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 the politics was very intense beginning in 2021, and it still exists today. So many people believe that this was an assault on their family by this, this notorious, this aggression against wolves. And of course, again, we see wolves as family members. So we felt like one of our family members were being attacked. So. Today, where are we at in Wisconsin? So we, Wisconsin is updating uh, the wolf management plan. Um, it'll be set, uh, uh, it's being reviewed by the public now. And we've, again, we've got some politics uh, revolving around the wolves here. Um, am I running out of time, Rosie? How many minutes? We, we, you know, we're, we're just running on your time right now. We're a little bit over. Um, so, and I want to get to some questions. So, okay. okay. I'll wrap it up. So, uh, so, okay. So again, there's some politics going on. Uh, four members on the NRB, the natural resources board uh, that were wolf advocates have been uh, uh, removed by legislative vote by the committee of financial institutions and sporting heritage and, it's going on and on and on. So what do I want to leave you with? We, and, and this is not only for indigenous peoples, but for non-indigenous peoples, we need to see the wolf as a relative and we need to nurture that, that relationship uh, with the wolf rather than see them as a resource. Um, as I mentioned to you, we have a lot to, we have much to learn from the wolf 
And because of our, our science is getting better, we're asking the, the, the scientific method better questions. And we're learning things. That, and just like Atlanta study about, well, you know, the, the emotional, uh, the emotional uh, um, sentience of wolves is now being learned through science. So uh, we have a lot to learn still about the wolf. And then I want to promote that indigenous knowledge can bring about new perspectives uh, about our human connection to the natural world. Okay, and, and I wanted to share some of that uh, with you today. So again, I want you to remember that Mayangans are a relative and not a resource. And just to let you know, this is our, our uh, um, this is our quarterly uh, magazine called Mazanayagan, which basically means the book or the newsletter. And we write about uh, the, the work that we do of protecting uh, our relatives, the wolf, the deer, the moose, uh, the fish, the wild rice. And we talk about those cultural connections and how we integrate that into science. So Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission, if you Google the website, uh, glyphwick.org, you can find this, this newsletter is actually free and it's online. So with that, I want to say miigwech bizindawiegomanungum. Thank you for listening to me today. Oh. <laughs>